survivor program, a chance for professors from nine different disciplines to compete with one another for your attention. If you could all take a moment now to silence your cell phones, that would be much appreciated. The Pomona Student Union, for those of you who don't know, is a student-run, nonpartisan organization committed to encouraging honest and open dialogue on campus. With this goal in mind, we conceive and organize panels, debates, and speakers on a wide range of political, cultural, and intellectual issues. As I'm sure many of you are aware from the sheer quantity of the people on this stage, tonight's event is not typical. Tonight, we are asking these nine professors to defend not just their ideas, but their very disciplines against one another. We could not, of course, include every professor from every department, but that should by no means be taken as a reflection on the relative importance of those departments not present. Many more professors were asked to join us than were able to schedule it, and just it would have been impractical to have 50 different disciplines on stage at the same time. This is impractical. Nonetheless, we have tried to populate tonight's panels, tonight's panel with something close to the full range of Pomona's offerings. Each distribution requirement is represented, most of them by more than one person. Another important thing to remember is that while this will be competitive, this sort of friendly competition is possible only because of the remarkable liberal arts atmosphere in which it is taking place. In the lead up to this event, nearly every one of the professors on this stage emphasized the importance of a well-rounded education learning outside one's primary work. This is to say that, regardless of tonight's survivors, we should probably all take classes from every last one of these professors. Tonight's event will have three parts. Opening statements, cross-examination, and closing remarks. Our survivors will be decided at the end by a very high-tech, invisible applause meter sitting right here next to me. Only I can see it. Now, so that I can stop talking, I'll have our contestants introduce themselves, beginning of their opening statements, and please first give them all a very warm welcome. So for your opening statements, please tell everyone your name and your field, and then in three minutes or less, explain why you do, or what you do, and why it's important. Uh, three minutes or less, that's going to be tough. Um, so, I could do history, I'm a member of the history department, um, but that would in some ways be too easy because you could do the history of any of these disciplines, right? I mean, and you can't really do the science of history, I don't think, but we may find out that you can. So, I figured that, that, one, that, one, that, one, that one is one already, so I'm not even going to try. I'm also a member of the classics department as of July 1st. I'm jointly appointed in classics, again, way too easy because it's kind of fundamental. Before any of these other disciplines existed, there was this, this, this kind of primordial multidisciplinary classics department, right? We covered all of these different disciplines and did it really in the, in the, in the Greek and Roman and Mediterranean part. Um, so in order to make it a fair fight, I'm going to defend something that you've never even heard of called lambs. Yeah! Lambs. <laughs> Late antique medieval studies. <laughs> For those of you who are more visual learners, <laughs> to be brief, classics is a great field. Like I say, one of the original multidisciplinary fields. But it stops pretty much with Constantine in the early fourth century. It stops, in other words, right when it starts to get new. Because with Constantine, you have this amazing merging of this religious tradition, Christianity, kind of uh, bastardized, neo-Judaism light, um, and, and it comes together with, with the Roman Empire, right? So Abrahamic tradition, Socratic tradition coming together, and suddenly things in the Mediterranean get really fascinating for the next, I don't know, 1,000 or 1,200 years. So stopping with Charlemagne is, is difficult. Uh, excuse me, stopping with Constantine is difficult. So with Constantine, with this empire and religion coming together, suddenly you get to talk about things in really interesting ways. It may have been Constantine's dream to use Christianity as a way to hold the empire together, but what's really interesting is that it's not Constantine, but in fact the early Islamic caliphate that actually accomplishes that, bringing religion and empire together. And so if you look at this period of time, late antique, going into early Middle Ages, 
then you actually get to follow the marriage of these religious traditions and political entities in ways that take you from the Christian empire up through the Islamic Caliphate. It gives you an opportunity too, not only to study these things from a multidisciplinary disciplinary perspective, that's easy for me to say, but it also gives you the opportunity to learn a couple of dead languages and, and one that's very much alive, that is Latin and Greek as a holdover from the classical period, but also the introduction of Arabic. Because if you're going to study Golden Age Islam and you're going to put your Arabic to good use, why worry about modern Egypt or Morocco? Why not go back in time and look at the Abbasid Caliphate and what's happening in the area of Baghdad and understand how that relates to all the things that are coming out of the Mediterranean, the Eastern Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean that have Greek roots, that have Hebrew roots, that have Christian roots, that have Roman roots, all culminating in the world of Islam. So if that's the kind of thing you like, and all of you should, and you'd be a lesser person if you didn't, <laughs> then, then Lambs is really for you. And by the way, Lambs normally would be spelled with a B, but I didn't really want to try to figure out what the B would be. It could be late antique medieval bullshit. Um, <laughs>
I want to I want you to ignore the disproportionate number of big award winners in neuroscience, and I want you to forget the high success that neuroscience students have getting into medical school and graduate school. Ignore all of those things. Let's talk about why neuroscience at work. And the answer is the whole mix. <laughs> Riots and 
and dictatorship of fascism and tyranny. The study of politics teaches us, as my friend Machiavelli puts it, that the prince must learn how not to be good. The study of politics, this is my politics briefcase, forces us to wrestle with it. All the madness that is in us, the devils indeed that are in each of us and that are all around us, all of us, all the time. And yet, the study of politics is the study of justice. You want to talk about what may be, let's talk about politics. The study of politics is the study of rights, of laws, debate, negotiation, compromise, and public discourse. The study of politics is the study of equality, of liberty, of democracy, of diversity, and citizenship. The study of politics is the study of civic engagement. It's the study of activism, of courage, of self-sacrifice, social welfare, and peaceful coexistence. The study of politics teaches us how to put down the sword or the machete, as it were, and in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to seek a common life that is instead defined by unarmed truth and unconditional love for our fellow human beings. <laughs> Divine aims, if ever there were. <laughs> In short, <laughs> a good lip for me, isn't it? the study of politics is about wrestling with the demons of human life, with the aim of figuring out how to allow what President Lincoln called the better angels of our nature to emerge and rule, even if that rule is necessarily imperfect and always under threat. Our very lives, all of our lives, as individuals, and as communities and as a species hinge on this quest and hinge on this study, the study of politics. <laughs>
because hundreds of years ago. And then there's the fun quotient. The fun quotient. It's not fun you have to buy by the total amount of fun you have. Uh, the total amount of time you have. That's the fun quotient. Mathematics has an extremely high fun quotient. What other discipline do people do, everybody do, many, many people do for fun every day? Open the newspaper, any newspaper. You have Sudoku, you have Ken Ken, you have all sorts of math games that people do for fun. Go to a toy store, what do you see? A Rubik's Cube. Math puzzles. Math is fun, and that's why you should do mathematics. <laughs> I got water. Um, do I get beer? I feel like I'm here representing music. I should go sort of for the Jim Morrison, Russell Brand look. Um, I guess not. Um, I'm Jody Rockwell. I'm a music professor. Uh, I teach mostly music theory classes here, um, but also courses on American popular music. And I've taught some uh, courses having to do with music and natural order, and also some music and mathematics. Um, I just need to start with a very simple, basic question. Um, show of hands here. How many people don't like music? <laughs> um, okay, so that's a, that's a great starting point here. That may not be the case. That, that would be my guess for uh, some of the other fields here. Um, <laughs> so it's good that we all agree on that. So, uh, everybody agrees that we should have music in society. We don't know a society without music. Music is, of course, fundamental in helping us get through adversity. Um, and some people might say that, well, why should, we, why should we study music? Why should we keep someone on an island who can actually uh, kind of analyze music in addition to, to make it? Um, I mean, the simple answer to that, of course, is uh, to some extent you have to, you have to study it to be able to make it. Um, but uh, maybe more interestingly, uh, music, and not everyone knows this, but music is one of the original liberal arts, as Ken um, could tell you. So if you look at the, the quadrivium as outlined by Boethius in the 6th century, uh, essentially music, along with uh, various branches of mathematics, um, arithmetic, geometry, um, astronomy, um, is part of important education. So this, the whole foundation for, for kind of what we do here intellectually uh, at Pomona, I would say, starts in medieval universities where we had the quadrivium. I mean, music was part of it, all of the part. Yeah. So, um, so, yes, we should, of course, study music in addition to making it. Um, and then you might say, well, why music instead of the other subjects? I mean, should we be disposing of other subjects here? Um, and I don't want to argue against other subjects um, here. All I'll say is just that if you, uh, these days, if you go to a music conference or if you're involved in music in some way or another, you will encounter all the fields that are represented um, at this table uh, tonight. So, in, in my primary field, which is music theory, if you go to a music theory conference, you're going to meet mathematicians, you'll meet a lot of people who are involved in, in the natural sciences. Um, composers and, and performers, of course, uh, represent more of the kind of creative and artistic side of music. Um, Musicology, which we can think of generally as, as just the study of music, um, also kind of represents uh, a sort of humanities approach um, to music and, and a historical approach to music. And um, ethnomusicology uh, includes kind of social sciences approaches. So uh, if you go to an ethnomusicology conference, you'll meet anthropologists, um, people who are involved with uh, cultural studies, um, and so on. So, in a sense, if you take music, I guess my argument is that you're going to get a lot of these other fields as well. Um, and that's part of the reason why I do it, in addition, of course, to the fact that, hey, everybody likes music. So I'm calling back from the Department of Sociology. Um, I also have a voluntary affiliation with the International Relations Program despite my disdain for that entire enterprise. Um, but this is because I studied politics as an undergrad, and when I went to graduate school, I decided to do something hard, 
and something worthwhile um, in Oregon to the rest of you. So I became a sociologist. Um, but I find myself in a really odd position here tonight. I have to explain what sociology is, and I'm not even entirely sure what it is. The old saw goes, you ask two sociologists what sociology is, you'll get at least three answers. Um, and this is very much true. We're not entirely sure what our field is. One of our foremost uh, researchers and scholars of academic disciplines, Andrew Abbott, likens sociology to a rest stop next to a highway, where those of us who had gotten sick of wandering around decided to pitch our tents for a while. And this is actually a really good metaphor, because sociology is the bridging discipline. Just like roads connect cities, we connect all academic disciplines to each other. So from uh, the professors of literature and the arts have learned from us the language of power and inequality. Economists have learned from us the study of behavior, even though they call it behavioral economics, it's really sociology. Psychologists have learned from us social and cultural factors, which they somehow call social and cultural psychology, yet not sociology. But it works even across the sciences, from a biology and study of ecosystems. We have taken their tools to come up with population ecology models of organizations, businesses, and social movements. From physics, we have refined their tools into the study of social networks. But, okay, that all sounds good, but why would you want to be a sociologist? Well, sociology is relevant to your day-to-day -to -day life. Sociology can tell you why men speak more than women in classrooms. Ever notice that? Sociology can tell you why your female professors dress more formally than your male professors. Sociology can tell you why your best friend is hooking up with that slut from down the hall. But that doesn't really say what sociology is. If knowledge is like a watch, some people are interested in time. So, but sociologists are interested in what makes the watch run, what makes it, what makes it tick, how it works. So we can tell the neuroscientists when and how their field became a discipline. We can tell the mathematician why Leibniz and Newton discovered calculus at the same time. We can tell the literature professor, the English professor, what the genres of 19th century novels were and why they related to economic cycles in the British Empire. In short, we have something to offer everyone, and sociology is really the study of humanity, and that's why it's the most interesting field in the world. And what this training is optional, but we're thinking about making it a requirement. Never be the last one in the queue, that's for sure. Uh, my name is Rick Haslett, and uh, I teach in the Environmental Analysis Program, but I started out as a uh, volcanologist on uh, uh, mountains that go boom, and uh, so a geologist, right? Which makes me nervous listening to my colleague, the mathematician down here. If I'm stuck on an island where the mathematician is evaluating the consumption of uh, human fodder, it's always the geologist that are eating first on expeditions. So, uh, in any case, uh, out at Kilauea, one summer making a film documentary at the coast with the lava flow pouring into the sea, my uh, colleague John Kiergord and I have a camera set up at a vent, and I suddenly get hungry and decide to go get a baked potato. And it's easy to bake the potato, I put it on a stick and put it next to a lava flow, and ten minutes later it's as baked as can be. So I go back to eating this thing, and bam! Big explosion at the coast, great cloud of cinder and ash, and I think, oh, jeez, I've lost John, this is terrible. And the cloud clears, and John is fine, the camera's all damaged. But that, uh, that put into my head the notion that you really need to look before you leap, and secondly, that the study of the relationship between human beings and wild nature is very important. You really want to know what you're doing. So those two themes, I think, come together in environmental analysis. And I'll give you one other brief anecdote, which comes from uh, central Nevada in the late 1950s at an area called, uh, appropriately, Area 13, which uh, was a site uh, where the government wanted to blow off uh, an atomic bomb just to see uh, what would happen. 
uh, terms of the distribution of the radiation. This isn't a nuclear explosion, it's TNT applied to an atomic bomb. And they do it, they blow up a bomb and pieces scattered over a few hundred square meters. Uh, and everybody sits back and says, oh, well, that's interesting, what's going on with Geiger counters? And uh, to make this place safe, we'll put a big fence around it, which they, they do, they construct a great big fence around the location. Uh, and uh, that area is supposed to be kept uh, off limits in perpetuity, 250,000 years at least. Now, uh, medieval studies may be a long time considered, but 250,000 years is a horse of another color. So what happens in the subsequent years? Well, uh, wind blows, and the radiation moves off the site into other parts of Nevada. The plutonium, which was supposed to leak into the earth and become part of the water table, out of sight, out of mind, instead becomes oxidized to the soil crusts in this area, where darkling beetles consume it. And the beetles, in turn, are consumed by birds that fly off to springs all over Nevada and shit it out. <laughs> plutonium pellets. So uh, this really illustrates one of the, the great uh, weaknesses, I think, of our contemporary time, and that is that uh, uh, you need to think outside the box. Everybody here has been good about discussing uh, the interdisciplinary connections of their, their field, but who amongst the engineers who did this test consulted biologists, hydrologists, geologists, rural sociologists, uh, some very important considerations fell between the cracks, and in terms of environmental analysis, we uh, try to consider uh, these points of, of uh, oversight uh, in ways that will help us relate better to the natural world. Uh, so, uh, if anybody's interested in building a framework uh, in that regard, please do consider environmental analysis as a field of study. Mean annual wage of a historian, 
then after that point, it just it just diversifies. It becomes less less significant. So if you think about it, you, you probably don't believe me, but but if you look at Baghdad in the 10th century, for instance. And you imagine these disciplines, they're, they're pretty much all represented. But the only two that really wouldn't be at face value, maybe three. Um, neuroscience is a little bit too modern, but it does grow out of the biology that comes from Plato and Aristotle and is developed by subsequent scholars and, and, and especially by Muslims who now are reading this in Arabic, having been translated from Greek to Syriac and Syriac to Arabic. Uh, environmental studies, same thing, except Aristotle really anticipated much of that as well when he was on the Isle of Lesbos and looking at all kinds of different marine biological specimens and figuring out what is all this. And the Arabs, again, when they got their hands on it, pushed it even further. We have to wait until the 14th century with Ibn Khaldun to get the father of sociology. Okay? Um, it takes a little while because that one's a little harder to define, as it turns out. Um, <laughs> but, but I consider them still all to be there in, in seed form in Baghdad in the 10th century. And all you need are a few extra languages to really get at. Until then, I'm perfectly happy to do it with you in English, okay? Um, but, but, but if you really want to challenge yourself, and if you really want to just get all of those pecuniary motivations off the table, because that's, that's really kind of irrelevant, and just focus on actually exercising your mind, then, then pick a dead language, or at least a classical version of a living one. And, and, and come on, let's go have fun. <laughs>
Um, and see something in it other than yourself. See something in it other than what you think you already know about the world. If you ever want to read a Shakespeare play and see something other than the human, um, take a class in the English department and um, you'll enjoy yourselves. So do we have any uh, reports, cross-examinations, questions that just need to be asked? Someone else on here? Is Professor Johnson's weight on the table for the rest of the evening? <laughs>
is to respect everyone and why you should, and dynamics of difference in power. But like I said, I don't have a background in that, um, having studied politics. So, um, I'm just a bad sociologist, um, really, is what it comes down to. But I wanted to give you a relevant example um, as to why you should become a sociologist. Uh, Facebook. Who here is on Facebook? Anybody not on Facebook besides me? Yeah, a few crap. Facebook is now the largest source of social data, and sociologists are analyzing it and figuring out who your friends are and why they're your friends and whether you should be with friends with them tomorrow. And if you want to figure out more about that, you should come take survey research methods from me next spring. <laughs> You don't need a calculator, the computer does it for you. Um, would it be alright if I played a song? Unforgettable. <laughs> 
Entschuldigung. Entschuldigung, das ist geht nicht. Wow, music on the West Coast. These are the things I love the most. I mean the song, I mean the symphony. Record CDs and MP3s. So get out your living room. Tune in to the quadrivium. We don't need other allergies. When you holler through me, we fossil our teeth. Study harmony, learn science, art, and humanities. You got homework? Bang it out. All those composers hanging out. Rossini, Puccini, Paganini. Journey. <laughs>
articulated and enshrined through the study and practice of So it occurs to me that in our interest in power and money, we've forgot the important third part of that triad, which is sex. Um, <laughs> desire. <laughs> so I'm going to read to you the first of um, 127 poems that Philip Sidney wrote to a woman in the attempt to get her to sleep with him. <laughs> Take notes. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
just to close the circle, I'm going to reach all the way back to the other side. Uh, that is EA. Because if you think about it, EA and, and LAMS are the only two up here that, that, that are primarily letters standing for something else. <laughs>
always love to argue with the historian. We never see eye to eye, but I always find it eminently productive. So I, I think that English, I think literary scholars should always argue with historians. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd have to take politics and Susan McWilliams with me, even though I've been picking on her all night. Because we're social scientists, and social scientists, we have to do the worst of both worlds. It's, it's a cross to bear. We have to argue, just like those in the humanities do. And we have to have evidence, just like those in the sciences. We can't just sit in our office and think great thoughts. We're sitting in our labs and collecting facts. We have to do both. I, I want to be with a biologist so I know what to eat, and a mathematician so I know how to eat it. <laughs> What is that you have in your hand? <laughs> it's a bird. Um, it's, a, it's a mammal. It's a right. Um. So why do I want someone on the island who's going to threaten me with a machete? <laughs> well, like I said at the beginning, politics is not just about those people who teach us how to use the sword, but how to negotiate with people to put down the sword. Politics is both about the devils within our nature and Do you all know what makes lambs cute?